If you're a fan of military aircraft, turboprops, or cargo haulers, you're going to want the C-130 Hercules in your hangar. The good news is, you already have the C-130. And today we're going to explore a free upgrade that actually makes it worth flying. Welcome to Flight Brothers FT, produced by Tim and Lee. Plan the flight, and fly the plan. All charts courtesy of Navigraph Charts, not to be used for real-world navigation. Be sure to subscribe and explore the rest of the channel for high-quality aviation content and entertainment. The C-130 can be found in your X-Plane 11 aircraft folder in a subfolder called Extra Aircraft. You may need to change a setting to make these display in the aircraft selection menu. The first thing you'll notice upon loading this C-130 is the horrifying old 2D cockpit. Originally designed by Jay Rowland for Laminar, this aircraft came with the 2D cockpit because it was intended to be a tanker for the X-Plane 10 version for iPad. The 2D cockpit is functional, but it's not really something most of us, including myself, can tolerate using at this point. It doesn't even have the angled glance views that used to give you a quasi-3D feeling on some of the other 2D models. Fortunately, the exterior of the aircraft is a pretty decent looking model with quite a few details, and it makes it fairly believable looking in flight. You definitely won't mistake it for a high quality payware aircraft, but it's definitely believable enough to be enjoyable. Personally, I never flew the C-130 though because the 2D panel was just a deal breaker for me. I wasn't willing to put up with that. Fortunately, the X-Plane community has seen the potential of this aircraft and solved our problems for us by creating a 3D cockpit. I would like to thank the user who created it, but honestly, I haven't figured out how exactly to pronounce that screen name. The link to the download page will be provided in the video description to so just scroll on down there and give it a go. The 3D panel version is easy to install. It's just pretty much simply copying the original aircraft folder and replacing a few files and folders. This 3D cockpit version features a modernized glass panel update which resembles the Rockwell Collins Flight 2. As you can see, the layout is actually pretty faithful to that from Rockwell. Now we're going to explore the features of the C-130 with a quick power-up tutorial and a little demo flight. Now this is never going to match payware, so this doesn't need to be a very extensive look around, but it will save you figuring out which are the dummy switches and the actual critical ones to turn this thing on. I believe you'll find that really it has enough features to be enjoyable for some casual flights. Certainly nothing you would mistake for study level, but uh, there are days when I enjoy just sort of a get in and go aircraft and I would say this qualifies. Personally, I plan on using it in some cargo liveries that I found on the X-Plane forum and I'm going to do some Air Hauler 2 cargo runs with it. The flow I'm about to demonstrate does not come from any published checklist. It's merely what has worked for me using somewhat standard sequencing for an aircraft power-up. As this aircraft is rather basic, its procedures are also going to be pretty simple and quite honestly very forgiving. So first up, on the overhead panel, on the top right, battery on. Next on the left hand side, but slightly above in the same row, is the inverter. Turn the inverter on and notice the red indicator light just above it. Now we are going to want to power the avionics, so we're going to move down to the co-pilots panel. Beneath the MFD, the multifunction display, here you will find the avionics button. Just turn it on, it indicates green, and all of your panel systems should now be powered up. Now that we have power, we can prepare for engine start. We have fuel cutoffs located on the pedestal below the throttles. Oddly enough, it is not necessary to operate these manually. They will switch on when you hit the starter. I do not know if this is a feature of the real aircraft or not. On the pedestal, we also have condition levers, but it seems like you will hardly get to use these at all, but they are there. On the lowest row of the overhead, we have igniters on the far left, and those will need to be powered on manually for your engines to start. The auto ignition is just to the right in the same row. 
but this is also linked just like those fuel cutoffs to the start switch. So you do not need to throw these switches unless you just feel like playing with more switches. I'll briefly note the bleed air switch above the igniters is a working switch. Its default position is down, which is on. There's no simulated APU or GPU here, but you do need to leave the switch in the downward on position for your engines to start. The engine starting order for a real C-130 is 3, 4, 2, 1. That's right inboard to outboard and then left hand inboard to outboard. The start buttons are located under the glass panel engine gauges. Starting three. One push and you can hear and see the engines are spooling and then igniting, rather FADEX style. Notice the fuel cutoffs and auto ignitions for engine three have toggled on automatically. Next up, starting four. As you can see this is a very quick startup. Just for fun, starting two and one simultaneously, just because I feel like it. I'm not sure if that's possible in the real C-130, but uh, certainly some aircraft can do it. I believe the 747 has a powerful enough APU. It can spool two at a time. And I really don't know if uh, turboprops take more or less than a enormous fan jet to start. Checking our engine indications, you will see RPM is in the yellow. There's a very narrow green band indicated on the dial and the red zone is only slightly beyond that. Flight Bro Lee did some checking for me and according to the actual C-130 manual, the T-56 turbo props run at a constant 100% RPM. Uh, I might need to go back and check if that's engine RPM or prop RPM because we, we do see some variation here in the gauges, but it does look like that engine RPM holds very close to 100% most of the time, and I would take that to be the green band. You won't really need to do much to stay in that band, but I have noticed that takeoff uh, at full throttle, it can exceed. So sometimes I'll just pull back the condition lever the smallest amount I'm able to, that knocks it back to the green. As the takeoff roll continues, I return the condition levers to max. Our panel warning lights currently show the parking brakes in red, generators as being off, and the pitot heat as off. The pitot heat switches are located on the overhead in the bottom row. Unfortunately, I have not located any generator switches. Uh, this is a rather nicely textured overhead panel and going through it you will find just about everything is a fake. We do have some working, uh, what, what is this, the uh, fuel pumps, fuel boost pumps are working and way up top there's some switches for the pressurization but they actually don't seem to do anything. But again, no generators found so if those lights really annoy you, you could set that to be a keyboard command or you could set it to a joystick, or you could just cheat and use the X-Plane uh, power-up systems from the top menu. Personally, I just ignored the lights. It did not seem to cause me any issues on my flight. We do have working trims located on the center pedestal here by our flap handle. As well as our Navcom equipment uh, tucked up here above the throttles. The radio and transponder are just default X-Plane style and the default FMC from X-Plane is rather oddly hidden halfway underneath the texture. So simply click on the screen, it pops it out, you'll use it just like normal. If you have any questions about how to run that FMC, we have a full tutorial and uh, if I can be a little boastful, I suspect it might be one of if not the very best tutorial out there. So go check it out. Above the pilot's MFD are the panel and display lighting knobs so you can adjust the brightness. Now might be a good moment to uh, acknowledge that the PFD and the MFD are on the wrong side on the pilots. The co-pilots are correct, but the PFD should be on the left, the outboard side for the pilot which would put it directly in front of him, and that MFD should be on the right towards the engine indicators. While this is annoying and odd, quite honestly, it probably won't cause you any issues in flight. It's not that hard to uh, adjust your gaze. As we get into uh, adjustment knobs here, I should note the scroll wheel function does not work in this 3D cockpit. So anytime you have an adjustment knob, you will need to click in the click region, or if you're making a large adjustment, click and drag. 
that can be a little tricky for some fine tuning things. You'll notice there's some more dummy buttons in here, but we have the essentials. We've got the course knobs, uh, map range is the small inner black knob, and the map mode is the larger back knob. Probably the trickiest thing to adjust here is the altimeter setting. Without that scroll wheel, it's just kind of obnoxious to deal with. Fortunately, the uh, the standard STD button allows you to go to 29.92 immediately, and so if you get too far off with it, that can kind of bring you back close. The IAS and VS setting knob, as well as the altitude setting, both work with relative ease, whether you click or drag. Some important notes just for functionality here, the autopilot source and flight director or command mode are all on switches right above your standby artificial horizon. This aircraft boots up default and nav mode, so you'll want to click through until you get it to GPS mode. On the far left, you have, uh, right now it's in black, the flight director switch. Clicking it once will move it into flight director mode, and you'll see it is lit with a rather dim yellow. Toggling it to the next mode, it will go to green, and that is your command mode. The autopilot is now actually in command of the servos. And again, toggling it one last time would be basically your AP disconnect. Our AP modes are fairly typical with one exception here, and that being not having a nav mode button. You actually do have nav functionality, but it's labeled as loc. So once your FMC is programmed, get the, uh, get the input switched to GPS, and then in flight, you will toggle it to loc and it will follow your flight plan just like you would normally expect from a nav mode button. All right, earlier I made a mistake by not turning on beacon lights before engine start. So let's find the lighting panel. On the co-pilots panel, we have our lights directly under the gear handle. We will use the beacon, nav, and taxi lights at the moment as we are functionally ready to get moving. Before I can forget, I have one useful tip for later in flight. This C-130 does not like to slow down. I find that probably inaccurate considering giant turboprops uh, have a lot of surface area, but either way, that's the way this thing works. So you will almost definitely have your engines at idle at some point during descent and approach phases. The gear horn will probably drive you crazy. So there is a silence button in the bottom left corner of the gear handle panel. Just make sure though that uh, as you're flying your approach, you run an approach checklist and confirm that the gear is down on final so that you don't have a belly landing. And just for demonstration, I'm going to pull these fuel cutoffs and just shut this ship down. I have some footage from a different flight that we'll actually use for the in-flight features. A variety of free liveries are also available on the forum, and I'll include the links to each one you're seeing here in the video description. But Basically, you can find a number of military liveries, as well as a couple of cargo ones, which, as I mentioned previously, I'm excited about because I would like to use them in Air Hauler 2. One thing to be aware of if you search for liveries yourself is this is the J. Roland version, and that's typically how it's labeled on the forum. For our flying today, though, we're going to use the included livery, the Combat Shadow, and we'll be departing from KLUF, which is Luke Air Force Base in Phoenix, Arizona. Luke Air Force Base is quite close to where Flight Brother Lee and I live, but it also happens to be where I have a lot of ortho, so it's going to make for some better footage. Your recommended tacky sea speed for the C-130 is only about 20 miles per hour, and I would say you probably want to hold to that because there's just a ton of sway if you try and turn much over those speeds. For takeoff, the recommended flap setting is 20, but I was not able to actually get that setting on this aircraft. Its uh, default notches, I believe, are 18 or 24, so this takeoff will be done at flaps 18. We're going to be able to rotate around 95 to 100 knots and then lift off. 
The aircraft, while flaps are still out, does not accelerate tremendously quickly, although you do have a decent amount of climb power. So as with anything else, as you gain some altitude and speed, you'll start to clean it up with the gear and the flaps. In my testing, the aircraft has correctly operated off of its autopilot, again using LOC as the nav function. It was able to follow the waypoints I input into the default FMC. I was a little curious about pressurization, as there is a pressurization panel, but uh, it, it's not functioning correctly if you mess with it up there. So I was very curious, so I set my flight to be at 15,000 feet. And sure enough, once we got up there, we never blacked out, which was interesting because I did not think the pressurization was working. So I would say uh, in just the forgivable things, or I should say forgiving things of this model, uh, pressurization is basically negligible. Now one of the primary purposes of this model, as originally created by Jay Rowlands, was to be a refueling tanker. And you've probably noticed that refueling drogue sticking out there on the port side wing. That drogue extends from a button on the pilot's panel. It's a simple toggle. You hit it, it runs out. It does run out rather quickly, as you'll see in the video footage, and it also retracts very quickly. But it's a nice little animation, particularly for an aircraft that doesn't have a lot of extra animations on it. For those of you that enjoy flying at night or in the golden hours, you will probably really enjoy the way this aircraft looks in the dark. We have these nice, uh, I'm not sure if those are reflective or illuminated strips on the side, but they kind of pop very nicely. And the aircraft, I think, as with most aircraft, looks really good in the sunrise or the sunset. Our destination on this flight is going to be Prescott, Arizona. That's actually spelled Prescott, which is something that threw me off when I first moved to Arizona about 15 years ago, but they pronounce it Prescott. So here you'll see our approach. It's really not my best landing by a long shot. Oddly enough, the first landing I did in this was a little bit better the other day, but I had the help of my eight-year-old son on that one, so maybe he takes credit for the better landing previously. But either way, after, uh, after a few more goes of it, I'm pretty sure it'll be very simple to fly. This aircraft is just not that difficult to control, and it was very enjoyable. So I hope we've generated some interest for you to go and download this free upgrade to your included C-130 in X-Plane 11. If you do indeed download it, please come back to the comments. Let us know what you think, if you enjoyed flying it, or if you found anything we did wrong here, or anything we just didn't notice. Please come back and tell us all about it. And remember, until next time, plan the flight and fly the plan. If you enjoy this content, consider buying us a coffee to show your support. Visit us at buymeacoffee.com slash flightbrosft or search for us from the menu if you'd like to contribute. A link will be provided in the video description below.